Yeah, all right, welcome back everyone. So today um, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Lawrence Richter, who will be talking about an optimal control perspective on diffusion based generative modeling leading to our best numerical method. Yeah, thank you, Lawrence. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the introduction and thanks so much for inviting me. Um, I said I will try to give you an optimal control perspective on diffusion based generative modeling today. Uh, myself, I'm Lorenz Richter. I'm a postdoc at Zuse Institute in Berlin, and I'm also a co-founder of the company DIDA. Um, and the agenda for today is that I will, to tr I will try to connect different branches of mathematics, namely sampling, optimal control, path space measures, and PDE. I guess some of these connections are pretty obvious and pretty standard. Uh, however, I think some other connections are maybe not so standard, and I hope that you will get something new from this talk on the one hand, theoretically, but then, um, yeah, in the long run, we are actually after a new numerical algorithm. So we hope that these different perspectives are on the same problem will allow us to come up with new algorithms that we can actually implement to solve either of the um, for um, problems, so to speak. Um, during the talk, I mean, feel free to interrupt me at any time. I'm always happy to, to answer questions um, on the fly. And before going into the details, I should also mention that this work is jointly done mostly with uh, Julius Berner from Caltech and Nick Nuskin, who's at King's College in London. Okay, so uh, to set the stage, we are motivated or interested in generative modeling, where I would say the general task is to sample from some complex, potentially high dimensional multimodal distribution D. And I would say one can distinguish two settings, namely either this distribution could be given by a bunch of data samples, Xi, for instance, these images here, right? So you could have a lot of images of cats, which basically define your data distribution and you want to sample new data um, samples from this distribution D. But there's also, also the second case where you don't have data samples, but you have an unnormalized density function given, which basically describes your, your distribution D. And I would say this uh, second case is yeah, more prominent in the sciences. So computational physics, chemistry, but also many other applications, certainly also Bayesian statistics. So there you typically, typically have the case where you don't have data samples for the density. And I would say um, the, the first case where you have data samples ha has already led to significant success in the last years. And I guess you all know these uh, cool pictures that one can create with um, generative modeling ideas now. So basically all these pictures, I, I didn't do them myself, but I stole them from the internet. Uh, they have been created artificially with generative modeling, but this is the setting where basically data samples have been available in the training uh, case, in the training setting. So we actually focus not on the first case, but on the second case. So we are interested in the, in the setting um, where we don't have data samples, but only an unnormalized density, which then corresponds to the classical sampling problem, right? So you want to sample from some given density. So to make it a bit more formal, formal here's the setting. So essentially um, we want to actually try to move this here. We want to um, yeah, sample from a distribution, which is given by this, uh, P target density here, which consists of an unnormalized part, which I call rho, and a normalization constant, which I call z. And I try to draw a picture here. So this is the density we want to sample from. And we want to do this uh, via a controlled diffusion process. So this is an, uh, a diffusion that starts at some time zero and ends up at some terminal time, say time one. And the goal is that the distribution at terminal time shall be distributed according to the target density that we prescribe. Of course, we have to start somewhere. So we have to start uh, at an initial density. And so one can really understand this as somehow transporting some initial um, measure or initial density to the terminal density or terminal target measure, if you want. And to be a bit more precise, um, we want to model this problem by using controlled stochastic differential equations as the one written down here. So this is just um, a typical diffusion process. In this case, it has um, a fixed drift F and a control function U and where well, the sigma is the, the diffusion uh, matrix and it starts in the prior density. And now the task is basically, we want to identify the control function U such that if we start in the, in the initial density, we end up in the terminal density after terminal time, in this case, equal one. 
So the big question is how do you how do you find you? And um, we basically try to approach this sol uh, this this task. We try to solve this task by introducing another process, and this mm -hmm. is kind of the key idea that um, people have um, used in generative modeling a lot. Um, this process goes backward in time. So I put the arrow here from right to left. So it starts in the terminal density and it goes basically the um, yeah, reverse time direction. So I wrote this down here. So the Y process starts in the target and well, it runs then basically. And so basically I wrote it down here in a way that I start in the target. So I, I, I like this formulation more where basically um, I define my uh, terminal time again as zero and I let the, the process run. And then I basically just for notation, I need to kind of time invert these functions here. And it, it will maybe become clear uh, later why these SDEs look like this. But for now, just note that this SDE also has a control uh, V that we can learn. And now basically the task is that we want to learn the control functions U and V simultaneously, such that X U is the time reversal of Y V. Why do we want to do this? Well, if this is the case, then by definition, we immediately have that at terminal time, our XU process is distributed according to the target. Also the Y process would be distributed according to the prior, but okay, we don't care so much about this. And in fact, it will turn out this Y process is actually more uh, some kind of a, a helper process that we don't need to simulate after all. Um, but yeah, it will in the end give us a strategy how to actually find uh, the control function U. Okay, so this is the, the key idea. So now that this talk will mainly be about um, yeah, finding strategies um, for actually identifying these uh, control functions U and V such that we then can solve the, the sampling task. So before going into the general um, case, I want to uh, briefly discuss um, a specific case, namely the case where we actually uh, fix the V control to be zero. So I just copied the two SDEs from the previous slide and I put the V control to be zero. So this Y process, which as you remember, runs backwards in time. So it starts in the target um, is not controlled anymore. And in fact, uh, I, I guess many of you recognize this. So this is uh, exactly the setting that people consider in, in score-based generative modeling, um, where now the trick is that we essentially choose this fixed F function in a clever way such that at terminal time, we know the distribution of the Y process approximately. And to be more precise, people usually uh, take F to be linear. So just say uh, X, which then would correspond to an einstein uhlenbeck process, for which we know that at infinite time, it's distributed um, according to a Gaussian. And then the trick is to, to let it, the process run long enough such that after terminal time, capital T, it's approximately Gaussian. And we kind of accept this um, approximation error, right? So um, just to illustrate this a bit, I mean, this is kind of the, the non-fancy version of what you can really do, but I, I think it helps to understand the problem a little bit. So here I basically try to illustrate. So this, is, this would be a prior density. This would be a target density. In this case, the target density is multimodal and the prior is, is a Gaussian. And the task is that um, we basically yeah, want to learn the drift of the X process such that we can transport this density to this density. And in this case, the drift of the Y process, which is um, here at the bottom is prescribed. So it basically leads to yeah, let the, the, the particles diffuse basically. So this, I mean, up to time scaling, this is basically just the function X here. Um, and yeah, the big task now is to, to learn this, this uh, U control such that yeah, this drift here um, then eventually pushes you into the different modes, uh, which then basically um, yeah, is your sampling task that you want to, want to do, okay? So in this setting now, um, the question is, how can we find this U that basically uh, lets us reach the, the target density? And um, I can also formulate this as learn U such that X U is the time reversal of this um, function or this, this uh, stochastic process Y. And now uh, you can open the textbooks and uh, you find out that this, or actually the, the old, the papers from the old days and, and find out that this ta task has actually been solved many years ago. And I think there are even earlier works from Nelson in the seventies. Um, but yeah, it's, it's well known that um, this function here, 
U star, um, which is the scaled uh, gradient of the log density of the Y process. So with this PY, I denote the density of, of this Y process for um, arbitrary time T. That this function here um, solves the task of time reversal. And so um, this is then also, um, yeah, it's very often called score function, hence the name uh, score-based generative modeling. So the task in this uh, specific setting is really to basically learn um, or to approximate this uh, function here in order to fulfill the time reversal, right? Um, so, I mean, this has been known before, but when, when, we, uh, when we looked at this the first time, we immediately thought of this as an optimal control problem. So a stochastic optimal control problem. And I mean, it's kind of, for me, it's kind of intuitively clear because you, you want to learn this, this function in order to fulfill a certain goal at some terminal time, right? So this, this looks very much like a um, like finite horizon optimal control problem. And yeah, we wanted to understand this a bit more rigorously. And we could do this by uh, looking at this log density function here. So it's basically the function appearing here, uh, like in your, in your optimal um, solution that solves your task. And if I look at this function, so, okay, this is, there's also this arrow here, which um, as I commented on earlier, basically just means that we evaluate the function not at T, but at capital T minus small t. And we undertake the, the negative version of this, right? So the negative log density. And if I look at this function, I can very uh, easily see that this function fulfills uh, a partial differential equation, which is uh, written down here. It basically follows very, very easily from the Fokker-Planck equation. And if you stare at this, uh, then uh, you would realize, or at least people who are a little bit familiar with control theory realize that this is nothing but uh, a Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation, right? So um, important is that, I mean, there are some linear terms here, and um, then there's this nonlinearity here. And this has basically the, the form of an uh, HJB or Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation. There's also a terminal condition here, which, um, as the control people know, will uh, correspond to the terminal costs. Um, yeah, so this is basically a PDE that uh, describes my, um, yeah, my, my, the solution that, or like the, this log density and eventually also the score function that, that I'm after. So, question? So, yes? Do you mean to tell me that Poker Planck had that intuition guided by some optimization understanding? Um, I'm not sure if I completely understand your question, but um, the, the task now here will be to use um, kind of the Fokker-Planck equation to eventually come up with an objective for our optimization problem, which will be on the next slide. But I mean, now, so what we, we can, what we can in principle do, I mean, this is a PDE, right? And now you can try to, to solve this PDE and numerically. Uh, and if you can solve it, then you can basically solve this generative modeling task, right? So if you know this log density here, okay, you would have to take gradients, which you could, for instance, do with auto diff. And if you can take gradients, you have your U star, and then you have solved your sampling task, basically. So the solution of the PDE is kind of solving optimization problem? Um, yeah, I mean, the solution of this PDE is the so-called um, value function, which are the optimal costs to go. Um, and it is known that in these kinds of HJB equation, um, the optimal control can be written as the gradient um, of, a, of the value function, um, which then yeah, gives you basically the solution to your optimal control problem. Okay, that's a nice connection. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, feel free to, to ask more questions at any time. I have uh, another one for okay. the time reversal. Uh -huh. Is the time reversal concept connected to solutions of inverse problems? Not necessarily. So um, maybe we can come back to this later when we talk about applications. But here, the time reversal is really more some kind of artificial thing, right? So we use this concept of time reversal to eventually come up with strategies to find our optimal control. But we, I mean, it's 
it might not even be needed. Uh, it's, it's more kind of a conceptual thing to, to design our um, algorithms and our losses in the end. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks, so now, I mean, now we have this PDE here, right? So, I mean, one observation is we, we could already try to solve this PDE with whatever methods. Of course, it's kind of hard in high dimensions, but there are some ways around like tensor trains, or maybe you can use pins. And then you can basically try to approach the sampling task via this PDE perspective. However, we want to make this optimal control perspective even a bit clearer, um, which then eventually also gives us a method that we call DIS for time reverse diffusion sampling. And it looks as follows. So now from the HJB PDE, you can basically read off immediately the corresponding stochastic optimal control problem. And I wrote it down here. So this is again the control SDE from the previous slide, the one that we want to control such that we reach the target. Yeah, and here I get the cost functional. So this is this uh, functional L here, which takes the a U as an input. And I mean, note that it has some running costs and some terminal costs. And those terminal costs I can base, or this co these costs in general can basically read off from the PDE formulation. And now I can try to minimize this cost functional. And I know um, from control theory that um, the unique minimizer of this uh, objective is given by this function here, which if you remember the last slide, is just the function that we are after. So it's basically the the score function, right? Um, so now I have basically an objective that I can minimize in order to learn my control u, um, such that I can fulfill the, the sampling task, which um, yeah, which is nice and basically gives you uh, exactly the control, the optimal control interpretation of um, score-based generative modeling. Um, we, you can also actually formulate this in a more abstract um, setting by using so-called path space measures. And I, I tried to write this down here. So with these measures here, so P, X, U, uh, I denote uh, the path space measure. So the measure on the space of continuous trajectories of the process X, U. And so first of all, I can see that I can write this uh, cost functional as a KL. Okay, that's maybe not super helpful, but the second equation is a bit more interesting. So I can really write this down as the KL between the path space measure of x u, the one that I want to control, and the path space measure of the y time reversed process, which is the, the target that I want to reach, right? Because I want to basically learn the time reversal of the y process. So here I can simply read off that this is this is really happening. And here I can yeah, write this as a, as a path space measure a version of this. There's also this additional term, which basically takes care of the approximation error I make um, when not exactly being able from sampling from the um, density at yt, which I always approximate in practice by a Gaussian. But yeah, you can also ignore this for a moment. So the important part is, is this one, right? But yeah, again, I think the, the key observation is that, uh, yeah, we have this control formulation now. And now in principle, um, you could use any kind of numerical method that you like to basically try to learn this uh, control u. Okay, so now before, before studying the general case, I want to make a little bit of a detour. Um, maybe it will take five minutes or so uh, to, to comment on the other setting. Um, where we have actually not the density available, but data samples. That is actually the, the setting that people usually study when they talk about generative modeling. And the, the whole point I try to make is that we can also derive the, the quantities or the objectives people use in practice just from the control perspective uh, immediately, more or less immediately. <laughs> but one has to do a couple of tricks. So first of all, the previous laws it can only be used if we know the density row. I can simply go back. I mean, the, the row appears here. So if I don't have it, I cannot use it, right? Um, so we cannot minimize this directly if we don't have the unnormalized density. However, I mean, what one can do is one can use a trick. So instead of minimizing this forward KL, as it's called, where this measure of uh, the, the approximating measure is appearing in the first argument, we can kind of flip the arguments of the KL divergence. Note that the KL is not symmetric. Uh, and at the same time, we put this arrow here in, uh, from the Y to the X process, right? So in some sense, this is kind of trying to do the same thing, but with a different attempt. We can do this in the setting because if we have data samples, we would also be able to simulate the Y process, right? Because we can simply start at the target because we have the samples 
and we can let them run. So this would correspond to this um, uh, formula here, right? And now I can basically plug this in and I would get this kind of loss function here. But this still would not work because um, if you look carefully, you see that here at the, at the right-hand side at the terminal costs, um, there's a density of the controlled process. So of the process XU, which of course I don't have. So I don't know the density of the controlled process in closed form. So I can also not evaluate this quantity here. So there's another trick. Um, since this quantity is not known, um, I can try instead to, I mean, to not minimize this guy, but I can basically put uh, this one quantity, which I don't know to the other side, which would then basically give me an inequality uh, and the right-hand side, which you can see here, is then also known as the elbow in machine learning. So the evidence lower bound is just a name um, that one can try to, to optimize. And one can do this because one knows that in the, in the optimal value, you being U star, those two sides agree. So we have equality again, which guarantees that we are doing something reasonable here. Um, so this guy here, I could um, now easily um, optimize in this in this setting actually. And now there's uh, yeah there are two more tricks basically to recover the loss that people use in practice for these um, score-based generative modeling ideas, namely. Um, I mean, this is more now for the experts. I will not go into, into every detail now, but one can basically um, yeah, apply um, the divergence theorem to basically uh, get rid of this divergence and write it as this expression here, where this is basically a conditional um, forward pr transition probability. And one can note that certain terms here are actually independent of the function u that we want to optimize for. And we can try to basically write this time integral here as a Monte Carlo approximation, where we basically sample um, time as written down here uh, uniformly, which then would give uh, us this loss here. And I mean, the important, you don't have to understand all the details now, but the important thing is that one can really show that this is exactly equal to this quantity that we have derived on the previous slide. And this term here, I mean, up to constant terms is exactly the denoising score matching loss that people consider in practice, um, more or less at least, uh, when, when training these generative um, modeling attempts for let's say image generation or whatnot. Um, so, I mean, th the whole point I'm trying to make here is that um, mm -hmm. it's not something different. It's really just another perspective. And in principle, you could start with the optimal control perspective and then derive this loss that people consider in practice. So can I? Yeah consider the logarithm of the row over row that you had several slides again before, can I consider it as a regularization term? Yeah, that one here on the right side in the upper, upper line, mm -hmm. log row x something, mm -hmm over rho x something. That's a re regularization term? Um, it's a good question. I would say it's it's more like a terminal cost term. So I wouldn't call this a normalization. So it's really something that you that you need in order to basically solve your, your problem in the end. Um, and I mean, it, it also kind of, um, Okay, now you, you put it here to the other side, at least this. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if I would call it regularization, actually. Um, um, yeah, Okay. Not sure. But yeah, okay. uh, I have to think about this. It's an interesting perspective. And maybe another connection mm -hmm. that is this fraction is uh, related to radon nicodin change of measure. Yeah. This will actually come in a couple of slides. Okay, wonderful, yeah. thank you. Yeah, great, thank, good question. Very, very I'm good I'm just checking if I'm asleep or not, thank you. Okay, okay, cool, yeah, thanks. So actually it will come in on this slide if I remember correctly, <laughs> because now I will uh, get away from my detour again and come back to the actual problem where we again consider having the target density but no data samples, um, which is the problem that we are after in the end. And we now consider the general case, right? So we, we have now again 
two controlled SCE. So there's this V control appearing again. And the question here is then, um, yeah, how, how can we solve this? And we again take the path space measure perspective, um, which will turn out to, to, yeah, to be handy to actually find the numerical algorithms. So here, um, again, we take these path space measures. So on the one hand of the XU process and of the Y, V time reverse process. And remember from the uh, first slide, more or less, um, that the overall goal is that we want the uh, X process to, to agree, uh, like to, to be the time reversal of the, of the Y process. So translating to these path space measures, what I want is I want that these path space measures agree, right? That they are the same. So now we can simply try to minimize the divergence between these two path space measures simultaneously in the functions u and v. Because um, if I can somehow drive this divergence to zero, then I have solved the task. Because then by the definition of the divergence, basically, uh, I know that the path space measures agree. And then I know that the x u is the time reversal of the y process. And so this would be, yeah, this would be the general strategy here. I mean, divergence really in the classical sense. So it's something that is zero if and only if the measures agree and greater or equal than zero otherwise. So this is kind of the abstract idea. But now the key question is, can we make use of this numerically, right? And I think the, the key observation is that, um, yeah, one can say yes, <laughs> uh, one can actually, make very implement very much implementable things out of this by noting that one can write down a formula um, for the radon nukodum derivative between these um, two path space uh, measures basically so some kind of log likelihood uh, ratio between path space measures in, in quotation marks um, and you, i mean you don't have to understand the formula exactly but the key observation here is that it is an explicit formula in the functions u and v. There's also w on which I will comment in a minute. Um, and of course I have again the prior and the target in here, which I need to know in order to compute this uh, density ratio, this, this like log likelihood ratio, sorry. Um, and I mean, note that there's um, S in Gersonov's, I mean, it's coming from Gersonov's theorem, of course, um, there's a deterministic and a stochastic integral in here, right? And so with this formula, it turns out that I can actually compute a lot of divergences in practice um, very straightforwardly. So for instance, the KL divergence. Um, note that there's this um, XW here. So uh, I need to decide uh, along which trajectories I evaluate my um, log likelihood ratio. And this I can basically, uh, at least in this formula, choose arbitrarily. So I have this XW here, where I basically mean a process like here, but with a U replaced by a W. And in principle, I can choose W freely, right? But yeah, the, the key observation is that I can, I can really compute this. I can find a formula for this. And now I can try to tackle this minimization task here, right? Where I can try to consider a divergence and I can make concrete choices for actual divergences. Um, which I will do on the next slide. But before doing this, I should maybe give you the very important comment that as you might have guessed, this minimization problem is in general not unique, right? So in, in principle, what it's doing, it's kind of bridging the prior density to the target density. But you can already imagine intuitively that there are infinitely many possibility, possibilities to, to transport, uh, so, so to speak, or to kind of control the corresponding um, SDEs. Um, so in principle, one can find infinitely many pairs of U and V. Um, however, there are multiple ways to fix this and to make the, the setting unique again. One, I, uh, one approach we have already seen a couple of slides ago, namely by fixing the control V to be zero, which then is this method that we introduced called DIS. Uh, then there are other approaches like introducing suitable reference proce processes which refer to other methods that have been suggested recently. Um, PIS is one of them. DDS uh, is another, which is very much related um, to this um, yeah, score-based joint of modeling idea. Or um, we can um, somehow add additional costs. I mean, these are now certainly uh, interpretable as regularizers in some sense uh, to this problem. Uh, and for instance, one can add these kind of regularizing costs here in the path-based measure, measure sense. Uh, which then would correspond to the famous 
Schrödinger bridge problem. Uh, and yeah, we could, for instance, try to incorporate this into our minimization task. So basically, it's some kind of constrained minima uh, optimization then, where we basically want to drive this guy to zero while minimizing this uh, here. Um, but we haven't tried this numerically yet, right? So, but in, in some sense, I mean, this already tells you the, the minimization in the two arguments um, is a little bit more general, right? So it just gives you some bridge between the prior and the target, but it, it's not necessarily, uh, it's not a specific bridge, not like in the Schrodinger bridge a problem. Right? So it's a bit more general. And from a numerical perspective, uh, I mean, first of all, of course, we thought, oh, this is very dangerous. We should not, not do this. But then it turned out that one can even try to, I mean, one can try to accept this, or one can accept this um, non-uniqueness and simply minimize and do and these simultaneously. And I mean, as long as we find any minimizer, um, we have maybe solved the task. And I will comment on this again in the numeric section. So from a numerical perspective, one can also just yeah, minimize U and V simultaneously. Okay, so now uh, let's make things a bit more concrete uh, because in practice, we now have to actually choose a divergence. And I mean, one popular choice is this uh, kullback leibler divergence, which I wrote down here. Um, so this one can do, and this actually works. However, we propose uh, a novel divergence, um, which we call the log variance divergence. And it's written down here. So it's defined as the variance logarithm of um, yeah this Radonokodim derivative. And here again, this xw appears. So it's actually a family of divergences parametrized in the function w, right? And this is a divergence in the classical sense that it's zero if the measures agree and greater or equal otherwise. Um, so this w already hints at some nice uh, property of this divergence. Namely, one can uh, choose this w in principle freely, which in principle, allows to balance exploration and exploitation. So if you look at the KL divergence here, the W needs to be U by definition, basically, right? So the, the reinforcement learning people would say one has to optimize on policy. But with this log variance divergence, we can also optimize off policy, right? So we can balance in principle exploration and exploitation. Then also what is nice, if we minimize or optimize with respect to U and V, we don't need to differentiate through the SDE anymore, right? Because it's basically independent of U and V. Um, yeah, so these are kind of two nice observations already. And now I will comment on, on one or two more nice properties of this divergence. And for this, we first make an interesting observation, namely that there is a very clear uh, correspondence of this divergence here um, to the KL divergence. And it's given as follows here. So one can show that if one takes the functional derivative um, of this uh, log variance divergence with respect to U, and afterwards evaluates at w being u, then this is up to scaling exactly equal to the functional derivative of the KL divergence with respect to u, right? So these two things agree. So now, now you might wonder, okay, if they agree, how can the log variance divergence be any better? Um, and well, there's a catch because this equality only holds uh, in expectation. So if I have infinitely many samples, so to speak. But in practice, of course, I need to estimate my divergences or losses in the end with um, a finite sample size. And this is what I uh, denote here with this little hat here. So now I want to look at the Monte Carlo estimators. So these are really the Monte Carlo, estima Monte Carlo estimators of the divergence with a finite sample size. And then I can uh, show that um, if you look at this um, derivative or yeah, this, this gradient um, with respect to U of the log variance divergence, then this guy is a control variate version of the KL uh, derivative. So for the people who don't know what control variates are, um, it's basically um, so it's basically the same random variable plus another random variable which has expectation zero. So such that an expectation they agree. However, the statistical properties might change. Um, in particular, one can often observe variance reduction. So it's a, it's a classical variance reduction method. And this is in fact something we can see uh, quite a lot in our experiments. So this is an actual experiment where we basically try to optimize um, the, the machinery once using the KL based, uh, the KL divergence or KL based loss or the log variance divergence. And we look at the KL metric at the same time, 
we see that yeah, the log variance uh, divergence has much less fluctuations, so it has much lower variance. Um, and yeah, this also leads to the, to the fact that the minimization works better. So we get, get a, a smaller value after all, right? So we have this variance reduction, which usually implies um, faster and better convergence uh, compared to the KL. So this is, this is one uh, nice property of the log variance divergence, but there are also two nice other uh, properties, which we call robustness properties. The one um, of them is this one. So we call it robustness at, solution, at the solution. So it basically means that if you are at the solution, u being u star, and then take the, the derivative with respect to u, or the same holds for the case with the v control, so you are at the optimum and you differentiate, then the variance of the Monte Carlo estimators are zero. That's a nice property. Um, in machine learning, they sometimes call it sticking the landing. So it basically means that if you are at the optimum already, you have zero fluctuations. Right? So you're you can you are not you're, you're kind of sticking there, right? So you're not you're not um, uh, getting pushed out by random fluctuations uh, again. And so this is a nice property that comes with the block variance divergence automatically. Yeah, and then it has additionally a nice um, scaling behavior in high dimensions. So what I uh, write, try to write down here is some, something like the relative error. So the uh, root of the variance of this Monte Carlo estimator in the setting where I have product measures. So assume that uh, I consider product measures um, divided by the expectation, which is again, the log variance divergence itself. And one can show that one can bound this um, relative error uh, independent of the dimension D. Right, so this is a property that one usually wants to have in high dimensional problems. It's probably not a, a sufficient property, but I, it's certainly a necessary property. And um, so the, 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 the case is that the, the thing is that some of the divergences that, that are out there don't fulfill this property. For instance, the uh, psi squared divergence doesn't fulfill this property. So um, yeah, that's a, a divergence I would not take in high dimensions. However, the KL actually fulfills this property. And I should have mentioned before, this robustness at solution property is not fulfilled by the KL divergence, right? So this is really kind of a, yeah, a nice thing for the log variance divergence comparing it to the KL, okay? So this is what I wanted to say about this log variance divergence. And now, um, yeah, at, at the end of the talk, before showing you some numerical examples, I want to give you a little bit of an outlook, which also somehow connects to the log variance divergence actually. So it's more preliminary work um, that we're working on right now. Namely, we want to consider optimization problems, not on the entire trajectories, but only on sub trajectories, right? Because one problem in these um, sampling related um, generative modeling um, settings is that they are usually, as people say, not simulation free. So you need to simulate trajectories during optimization, um, which uh, could be costly, and which is probably one reason why the performance is still a bit behind uh, compared to the setting where you actually have the data samples, where you can actually have the simulation-free um, setting. So here we try to get a bit closer to this by not cons considering optimization uh, optimizations on the on the entire time interval zero to t, but only on sub trajectories from t naught to t one which would then lead to a loss like this. So I didn't define everything here. It's more about trying to, to show you the general ideas. And we're basically, yeah, you have now again, uh, the U and V function, but also you would have to learn the density because you wouldn't know the terminal and uh, the prior and terminal densities of the, of the time interval that you choose, right? So the idea would be to simply learn this as well in order to approximate the optimal density at this point. So this might appear like a very hard problem and uh, indeed it is. So there's one, uh, one idea to make this a bit simpler. Namely, one can exploit the so-called Nelson relation, which is a very well known, um, which basically relates the optimal U and optimal V to, to yeah, it relates them to each other. And one, one knows that the sum of those is exactly equal to this score function. Yeah, right? So basically, if you remember the original score based generative modeling, if V is zero, then this would be the, the score, right? And so now we can simply say, okay, let's try to learn this log density here, which I approximate, approximate by a function phi. So this could be a neural network. 
um, and I approximate V. Um, so basically V shall be V star at some point. And now I simply use this um, relation here, which I know has to hold at optimality. And I can derive my function U from these two functions by this relation here. And now basically I can get a loss that, uh, yeah, where I only have to learn two functions again. So this function phi, which would correspond to an unnormalized log density and the control function V. And um, yeah, now I can basically define losses. I, I didn't even write down the exact definitions here. So you don't have to understand the details, but the, we can't even understand the details because I didn't tell you how, <laughs> but um, the point is that here we have again quantities like uh, like deterministic and stochastic uh, integrals, and we have some to, uh, like initial and terminal values, which in this case are learned that can be optimized with a corresponding um, log variance like a divergence. So I can again for this divergence take the log variance divergence, and in fact in this setting it's kind of crucial to have a divergence, um, which I can evaluate kind of uh, at arbitrary positions in space. Um, because uh, in the KL divergence, this would not be the case, then I would have to really draw samples from the uh, XU process, from the current control process XU, um, which I usually cannot do easily, right? So um, this is why for the KL um, subtrajectory optimization would not easily work or probably not work. Um, but for the log variance divergence where I can really sample any kind of forward processes, um, this works. And I will show you later some preliminary work where we already um, made it work. But yeah, this is a little bit work in progress, to be honest. So now at the end, I would uh, show you some numerical examples to kind of demonstrate this, that this really works. And I mean, in all of our experiments, we parameterize U and V by neural networks and then do gradient descent. And we basically compare using different divergences, so KL and log variance, and we consider different methods um, the ones that I mentioned before, PIS, DIS, uh, which correspond to kind of unique um, minimizers and this general bridge setting here that, that we have discussed, right? And I start with uh, looking at some kind of easy example, but it already actually tells us something. So this is a Gaussian mixture uh, model in two dimensions with nine modes. So here's the ground truth. And um, yeah, here, if you first look at the pictures, I basically plot the end results of the sampling task after having minimized my whole ma machinery. And um, yeah, we, we compare, in this case, uh, KL and log variance on the PIS and on the DIS method for, for these pictures here. And we see that um, by just using a different divergence, so everything else is the same, um, we get much better performance, in particular, in this case, much better mode coverage. Uh, which is maybe along the lines that it is known that the KL divergence suffers from mode collapse. Um, here, you can also look at some more quantitative results. So we look at um, the difference of the log, log, uh, log normalizing constant. Um, in this case, we, we know the true value because it's, it's just a Gaussian case. We can uh, look at some Wasserstein two um, metric for the samples. We can look at the effective sample size and we can look at the standard deviation of the marginals, which, which somehow quantifies mode collapse. And so in this example, which is admittedly not super complicated yet, we can already see that uh, choosing this log variance divergence um, yields, to, uh, yields much better results compared to the KL divergence. Um, here's another example. It's kind of a, a funny one, um, which is, uh, again, two dimensional, but it's it's quite a bit more complex. So basically the idea is to have a density that is coming from an image. So think of this as pixels and um, it kind of defines uh, a density um, with a lot of indicator functions if you want. Um, and yeah, for, we can also try to basically sample from this um, density. Let's assume that this density is given. And yeah, we again trained with KL, which didn't, give amazing results, but yeah, by simply choosing it to the log variance um, divergence, it, it got much better results and um, yeah, improved, improved at least qualitatively in this case, the sampling quality. Then we also looked at um, samples that are um, more prominent in um, the sciences. So say computational physics or molecular dynamics, where they often consider these double well or actually multi well uh, examples, which are pretty difficult to sample from due to 
uh, multimodality. And yeah, here again, we compared um, log variance loss to KL, where um, in this case, yeah, the, the log variance loss is also a little bit better. And we can again see looking at the marginals that with this log variance divergence, we can in this example at least um, yeah, recover the modes quite a bit better. Whereas in the KL case, we again get mode collapse. So I should also comment, I mean, this is, it's not always as clear as in, in this example, uh, but it happens uh, from time to time that um, we get quite a bit better a mode seeking be, uh, like mode coverage behavior of the log variance loss. And we also scaled this to higher dimensions by simply adding some Gaussians here. So to 50 dimensions to basically show that this also um, scales to high dimensional problems. In this example, actually the, the log variance advantage is not so, so big, um, but yeah, there are other examples where it's then again more, more prominent. But I think the so the, the bottom line is that uh, not always, but very often the log variance gives uh, better performance. And we rarely saw that it actually got worse performance than, than KL. Yeah, then last but not least, I want to show you this preliminary work on the sub trajectories, where we basically chose um, a kind of complicated target again. In this case, it's, it's only two dimensionals, but it's highly multimodal. And um, so here, um, I mean, the, the contour line is basically the target and these red dots here in the left picture are the prior. So this basically tries to model the problem where the prior density doesn't have a lot of overlap with the, with the target density, which admittedly is a bit chosen in this case on purpose such that we can demonstrate the, the power of the sub trajectory idea. But it's, it's something that, that can certainly happen in, in practice. Um, and so here we compare the KL and log variance method which don't work amazingly, um, but log variance a little bit better maybe. And yeah, here we basically try the sub trajectory idea where, where we can basically balance exploration and exploitation also, and basically yeah, only optimize smaller traje trajectories at a time. And yeah, in this case, I mean, it's just a qualitative result so far. Um, sampling schemes seems to end up uh, much better compared to the other attempts. Right, so with this, uh, I would like to conclude and um, yeah, recall that we tried in this call um, or in this uh, talk to um, establish connections between optimal control, PDEs, path space measures, and diffusion-based generative modeling, such that now we can basically try to attack either of the problems from uh, methods from uh, with methods of the other um, perspectives, right? So basically, if you're an optimal control guy, you can now say, I take my favorite optimal control method and apply it to uh, diffusion-based generative modeling. Um, that's basically what's uh, written there. Um, we introduced algorithms to sample from unnormalized density and which uh, are already competitive to other sampling methods like MCMC or sequential Monte Carlo. And we have um, yeah, studied the log variance divergence, um, which usually outperforms the KL divergence. There are a lot of um, follow-up questions, just to mention a couple. So one is to investigate this Schrodinger bridge problem, especially to see if there are any new numerical algorithms coming out of our framework, to study more the exploration versus exploitation and the optimization, which might um, be able to, to deal with mode collapse. Um, then, for instance, as I already mentioned, to approximate the HJV PDE with different methods like pins or tensor trains and to try to then approach the sampling problem with this. Of course, when one can now in principle consider arbitrary divergences. So basically you tell me your favorite divergence and we can simply try it out. Um, and yeah, optimization um, without simulating entire trajectories. So these sub trajectories, I think this is a promising and um, exciting um, new research direction that we're trying to follow. And of course, in general, the, the task is to, to scale all this to more high dimensional problems as uh, has been successfully done in these um, generative modeling attempts where you have data samples. But yeah, I think the, the case where you don't, don't have data samples, but only the density seems to be quite a bit harder. Um, so yeah, much work has to be done, I think. And it's, it's an exciting topic at the moment. Yeah, so with this, thanks a lot for listening. Um, here are the papers that, um, uh, where you can read up stuff and also don't hesitate to send me an email. Now I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you very much, thank you.
Uh, young, to, do you want to ask your question directly? Uh, yes, uh, thanks very much for your presentation. That's really good. Uh, so my question would be, in your last example, I think it's a numerical example. So you, you mentioned you're using a uh, sub-trajectory. Mm -hmm. So uh, empirically, how did you choose uh, the length of the sub-trajectory? Yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, I'm just going back maybe to the general uh, subject idea. So of course, yeah, you have to choose the length here. So you have to choose T0 and T1. Uh, I can't remember it uh, exactly anymore, but I think we took something like 10% um, or 5% of the entire um, trajectory. But in principle, I mean, this, this needs more numerical investigation and maybe even theoretical investigation. So there might be an optimal trajectory length. It might also be possible to just sample the length randomly. So maybe this helps. Um, it's not so clear to, to us at the moment. Um, but yeah, in this experiment, I think we chose something like uh, five to 10% of the, or uh, like the entire trajectory. Yeah. Just maybe related, related, yeah. related <laughs> question. In simulation, we produce some trajectories, right? Mm -hmm. So how in the simulation process I can do sub project tools? Mm -hmm. So here basically the, the idea is really, I mean, with this log variance divergence. So maybe let me go let me go back to the to the definition. Um, one key observation is that you basically can input trajectories here, which are not necessarily coming from, from your X, which are not your middle, basically, right? So um, I, I basically start, um, yeah, at, at, at a time t, t0, as, as we had on the previous slide. And I, since I can start everywhere, I don't have to start at the, de uh, the density where the, where the, like, of the control process. I can simply let this run and I can basically uh, get, so if I go back to the radon nucleodium derivative, I can get uh, basically this formula where now instead of zero to T, I would have T zero to T one. And instead of uh, P prior and P target, I would have the corresponding densities uh, at the times uh, T zero and T one, which of course I don't know usually. So I have to learn them as well. And this is basically why, now I'm going back to this uh, slide again, why one additionally has to learn these log densities, which here we approximate with this function phi. Okay, so it's not a straightforward random no. uh, thing uh, like in Monte Carlo. Um, not ex not exactly sure what, but no, it's not super straightforward. So um, okay, yeah. there is a lot of learning process uh, uh, steps. There. I have a question. At the very beginning, you had the normalization Z. Mm -hmm. How is this related to the partition function in Boltzmann? I think it's the same, right? So. I mean, if I go back to the very, one of the very first slides. So, um, I mean, this, this, that is just uh, the integral over rho, right? So you can okay, write this. So it is the same. Okay. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. And so and maybe it's a good, have... let me just comment. So it's, it's a good, good point actually. So basically this control objective gives you immediately the partition function or the log oh. partition function, because the, it, it, it is exactly the minimum value of your, cost functional. Okay, that's very good point, yeah. And <laughs> when you had this picture, when you had the picture before, the slide before, yeah. This one? Mm -hmm. Can I have more than two? More than two processes? On the right side, I have two parts. I started with one part, right? One distribution. Now I have two distributions, right? Mm -hmm. On the right ah. side, can I have more? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. So there's like a prior density and a terminal density and you want to have two terminal densities or? Maybe three. Well, I mean, you, 
you can just consider like a product measure. So you can define your new uh, determinal density as the product of two densities. Um, and then later you can kind of cut them in pieces again. <laughs> so that would work. Um, but the setting is usually that you, you need to write the problem in such a form, right? So you need to basically define one uh, target density and then you can try to sample from it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks. Thanks for the question. I have a question. Uh, okay, yeah. I, I have also a question about uh, the log variance that we read. Mm -hmm. uh, so you showed some couple of examples where it's performed very well done two bar level divergence. So uh, I wanted to ask, uh, as you try to to search uh, at which extent the log variance divergence is better than the two bar level. I'm not sure if I could 100% understand the question. So did we uh, investigate to which extent the log variance is better than the KL or can, can you repeat? Yeah, at which extent the okay. log variance is better than the feedback level that I see. It depends very much on the problem, to be honest. So there are problems where um, it's, it's really much better. Like, of course, I, I chose a little bit also the examples um, where, where you can see this very nicely, like this one. I mean, here it's, it's just much better. But then there are other examples where where the performance is kind of the same, right? So it really depends a lot on the problem. And maybe I go back to the to the divergence again. And I think one, one key question is um, how much, um, if I go to this slide again, how much is the variance reduction of this control variant, uh, which again, depends quite a bit on, on the problem, right? So uh, for this general setting, it's kind of hard to to make statements uh, on that. Um, and I, I don't want to oversell um, the, this divergence, right? So sometimes it, okay. it doesn't work better. Uh, but um, yeah, it depends on the problem is the short answer. We actually have a paper where we um, investigate uh, the performance a little bit more rigorously in the density case. So these are path space measures, then it's getting a bit more complicated. But if you consider simply densities, um, then you can also derive certain a bounds where you basically can relate the log variance uh, derivative and its variance again uh, to, to a naive version. And you can show that in certain, like given certain assumptions, um, this is really uh, better than, than, than the naive thing that you can do. Yeah. So uh, I am working on, uh, on graph generation. And do you think it's also can be also useful to, to try the log variance instead of the cool back level? Um, sure. I mean, whenever you use the KL, you could simply try to replace it with the log variance, and then it could be useful. Yes. And I mean, one one cool thing is that one doesn't have to change a lot in the code, right? So basically, one has mm -hmm. to exchange two or three lines. One has to be a little bit careful because there's the W here. I mean, you can also you can you can send me an email if you have a, a question. So one needs to be careful to kind of detach. Uh, this random variable from the computational graph because we, you, you must assure that there are no gradients computed with respect to this quantity. And that's it. So usually if you have an algorithm where you have the KL, you ha just have to change uh, two or three lines and then you get the log variance divergence. And basically, yes, whenever you, you have density, whenever you have probability measures um, in, in one way or another, you can use this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe I will be reaching to you. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, just send me an email. I'm, I'm always happy to chat. Yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, I have one question. So, mm -hmm. do you need to always assume the prior distribution to be Gaussian, or it can be arbitrary distribution, the prior distribution? Yeah. It's a very good question. So in principle, it can be arbitrary. However, um, yeah, we need to be able to sample from it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because the whole machinery works that, I mean, we want to approximate the U. So if we, we first sample from the prior, then we simulate the process and then we end up in the target. So we need to be able to sample from it. Um, but yeah, in principle, you can take any uh, prior then like any density from which you can sample and which you can evaluate up to normalization constant. 
Mm, okay. Well, another question is about the you and we. Uh, so you mentioned the neural, there are two neural networks, one yes. for you, one for we. Uh, so we know that the institutional models uh, usually there is only one. We only need to train one yes. uh, neural networks, right? So to go from a Gaussian mm -hmm. noise to some uh, some uh, real high quality images. But uh, here you, you you do it slightly different. Okay, why do you need to train two neural networks? Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so, I mean, the setting is a, a generalization of this uh, setting where you only have this one, right? So this is what I, I, I showed here, right? Um, and the reason is um, that, I mean, firstly, be, be exactly for, for that, what you just asked for, right? So then, then we can take arbitrary priors, right? Which we cannot take so easily in the, in the special case here. Um, also, we can make sure that we don't have uh, an error from this approximation um, of using a Gaussian, right? So even in the score by strength of modeling, uh, it's only, I mean, in theory, only approximated, uh, um, um, distributed approximately like a Gaussian. And so this additional control V basically takes care of reaching the prior density exactly, right? So basically we can remove this, this source of error. And th these are basically the two reasons. Um, so I, I'm I'm not sure if it will. I mean, it's, it's it deserves more. It needs more numerical investigation to understand if it's really um, helpful in the end. But in, in, certainly, it's a, it's a more general framework, which also allows us to draw uh, more connections to to other methods. Um, yeah, like like the ones that I, I mentioned before. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So actually, in, so when you do sampling in your experiment, actually you use two neural networks uh, or you use one. Uh, so when you do sampling, you use yeah, two. So, huh? so we, we tried both. Um, and I mean, in the paper, you, you can, there are much more experiments actually. And um, so for some experiments, it works work better to use two neural networks. For some experiments, it, it worked better to only use one and kind of use this, uh, um, method where you basically uh, yeah accept the, the the small numerical error that you make, and I think the reason is exactly uh, what I what I commented on. Uh, where was it here? Basically, that yeah, if you minimize uh, only one, you have uniqueness, and if you minimize two, they are not unique. And this could either be good or bad because I mean they might become unstable due to non-uniqueness. On the other hand, you have more um, possible solutions. So it, I mean, yeah, it's, it's maybe not a satisfying answer, but it, so in, from our, in our experiments, it depended a bit on the problem, which one worked better in the end. Um, but yeah, so I think it's still nice to have this general framework and then basically you can, you can test out different things and, and then later decide which one works better. Yeah. Oh, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you, Lawrence, for the nice talk, and uh, thanks everyone for coming, and see you next week then. Yeah, bye-bye. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye-bye.